So, okay, so again, uh, thank you very much for coming. This is now, I don't know, this is a fourth of this interesting talk this year. Um, and uh, uh, we have a great guest today, Jack Cohen. He is a retired US Forest Service research fire scientist who has spent years determining how structures ignite during extreme wildfire. Jack served as a research um, physical scientist for uh, how to say that the Missoula Fire Science Laboratory. He has been in, did I pronounce it right? Yeah, the Missoula Fire Science Laboratory. Missoula, sorry. Yeah, yeah. If there's anything comes with a R or L, I have a problem. So he has been involved in a wildland fire research since the early 70s and has served at the US Forest Service Fire Laboratories in Missoula. MT, Riverside, CA, and Macon, GA. He was, uh, he ha was a co-developer of US National Fire Danger Rating System and has contributed to the development of US Fire Behavior Prediction System. At the Riverside Forest Fire Laboratory, he conducted research on uh, live fuel fire behavior in Southern California, uh, Schwabland and also served uh, operationally as a, a prescribed fire ignition supervisor and the fire behavior analyst. For the most of two decades, Jack focused his research on how wildland urban fire disasters occur and how homes ignite during extreme wildfire. He was one of the principal scientists involved in the International Crown Fire Modeling Experiment, Northwest uh, Territories, where he investigated the thermal characteristics of uh, Crown Fires related to the structure, ignitions, and the fire spread. Jack currently focuses his research on the fire dynamics related to live shrub and tree canopy fire behavior and that continues a portion of his time revealing opportunities for preventing wildland urban fire disasters. And uh, he, we invited him last year and it was so great. So we invited him again this year. And I really would like to say thank you for, uh, to him for taking his time to come back this year again. And please welcome uh, Mr. Jack Boyle. Thank you, Hitoshi. Um, so without, I guess, further ado, I will get on with the presentation. And um, is that is that good, Carlo? Yeah, OK. So I'm going to get off screen and get on with the presentation. So the. Let, let me check something here because sometimes I end up with um, the screen. Yeah, good. Okay. So the title of this um, lecture is Opportunities for Preventing Home Destruction During Extreme Wildfires. And really the point of this presentation is community fire destruction during extreme wildfires that needs to be defined as a home ignition or a structure ignition problem. So what I'm talking about are, are fires where many homes and businesses, wildfires, extreme wildfires, where many homes and businesses burn to total destruction during extreme wildfire conditions. Well, so in order to, to really grasp the, the wildfire issue and the wild and wildfire related to community destruction to effectively manage wildland fire and prevent those disasters, we need to recognize the context of wildland fire. So we need to recognize first off that wildland fire is a natural disturbance, an appropriate ecological process. 
as well as a natural hazard, an initiator of community burning. Without recognizing both of those, and just as a, essentially, we focus as a society on wildfire as a natural hazard, and typically don't understand that that fire occurrence has actually in our natural history of North America, particularly since the, the retreat of ice sheets in North America, it has been an appropriate ecological process with humans lighting or igniting these wildfires. So let's take a look at wildland fire as a natural disturbance. So there are some basic facts, axioms that we need to recognize. Wildland fire occurrence is inevitable. There is nothing in our history or the trends, current trends that would indicate otherwise than inevitable. And we need to recognize that North American ecosystems with very few exceptions developed with and were maintained by fire ignited by humans as well as lightning since the end of the ice age and where I live around 12,000 years, but now we're finding out in the Southwestern US, maybe more like 20 to 24,000 years. And we also need to recognize that the elimination of First Peoples Native American burning, along with the European settlement of agriculture, urban development, and modern attempts at fire exclusion, that we have significantly reduced and changed the occurrence of wildland fire, not just in the Western US, but throughout North America. So specifically in the last 100 years, wildfire suppression has largely kept 98% of wildfires small, largely eliminating the historical ecological influence of wildland fire. So that 98% essentially control of wildfire has been going on for more than 100 years. It started roughly effectively in around 1920. And even at that time, 98% of the ignitions were, were controlled at small size. Well, so what about that 2% of wildfires that escape initial attack, that escape initial control? and become extreme during the most severe uh, weather conditions, which is actually less than 1% occurrence of the time. Well, what has happened is that our attempted wildfire exclusion has actually increased the potential for extreme wildfire conditions over extensive areas. These are the conditions when wildland urban fire disasters occur. So how does that paradox happen? Well, we control, we essentially eliminate the appropriate occurrence of fire on the landscape, but the vegetation doesn't just quit growing and quit propagating and quit developing, it continues. So the amount of fuel and the continuity of fuel and the composition of the vegetative fuel changes and increases towards greater severity of fire occurrence, greater intensity of fire occurrence. So basically when we suppress, when we control 98% of the fires, we're not eliminating, we're just postponing the inevitable fire occurrence to more severe conditions. Well, so what about wildland fire as a natural hazard? It has been historical, particularly in the lower 48 states of the US, the contiguous states of the US. Initially, we had very large fires in the Lake States area between 1870 and roughly 1919. Historians frequently, fire historians have frequently called this the great barbecue. 
But when we look at this area and we see these very large fires that resulted in about 2,000 civilian fatalities during this period and numerous entire towns destroyed, well, it wasn't fire suppression then. How did we have such large, severe fires? Well, during this period in these locations and particularly in the lake states of the US, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota, there was a huge amount of settlement, a huge amount of, of tree cutting with the slash left behind and slash and burn agriculture, which left huge heaps of slash. They were burned to get rid of it. And then when severe weather conditions came along, big fires. So, so in that particular case, we're talking about human activity generating conditions for very large, extensive, intense wildfires. So in the next period, we have declined in that kind of settlement in the US. And we still have houses burning down. But now we're talking about a background of wildfire. Notice that California, from north to south, tends to dominate this list. So now what we have is the general background of fire occurrence, the inevitable background of fire occurrence, and increased habitation, increased development, human development. Well, in this period, less than 100 civilian fatalities occurred, but now we're actively suppressing fire as fire agencies, national as well as state. So now we start having firefighter burnover fatalities. And in this case, about 5,000 homes were destroyed. Well, so the modern demarcation, the modern separation point or recognition point for what became known as the Wildlander Urban Interface was in 1995, 19, 1985, I mean. And it, during this year, 1,400 homes were destroyed primarily in Florida, North Carolina, and California. And this, at the same time that the politics was reducing funding for land management agencies, this became a motivation, a, a, a reason to exist and maintain or increase budgets. And so the Wildland Urban Interface Initiative, which was a collaboration of federal, state, and local agencies occurred, and this developed FireWise, Fire Adapted Communities, and other current programs. Well, so how has that national recognition influenced wildland urban fire disaster occurrence since 1985? Have we solved the problem? Look at the trend of, of destruction of 100 houses to uh, just less than 1,000 houses. We see that there is a regular occurrence, and particularly, and, and this list is between 1990 and 2019. And what we begin to see is not only a continuing occurrence of this level of burning, but also a place like Colorado is beginning to have records. More people are building in locations where there are inevitable fires. But when we look at more than a thousand houses destroyed during a severe wildfire, we see that particularly since 2000, there is a huge increase in the number. And we can sort of use as an example that between 1985 and 1994, that 10 years, there were about 9,000 houses that burned in that 10 year period during severe wildfire, extreme wildfire behavior. In, in 2018, 
there were over 16,000 totally destroyed homes. So national attention that has increased suppression resources and created collaborations with federal, state, and local agencies, that national attention has not effectively abated the increasing trend of wildland urban fire disasters. So we've increased wildland fire suppression, wildfire suppression, and therefore we've continued and even exacerbated the wildfire paradox, the, the natural disturbance side of fire. And so national focus on fire as a natural hazard with suppression as our principal response, particularly with regard, particularly motivated by community protection, continues fire largely not occurring as an appropriate ecological factor, particularly in the Western US, continuing the wildfire paradox. And maybe most importantly in, in this regard, communities are largely not becoming ignition resistant they're remaining ignition vulnerable to extreme wildfires. And thus with increased development, we're seeing increased wildland urban fire disasters. So a conundrum, how can we have wildland urban fire or how can we have wildland fire as an appropriate ecological factor without having wildland urban fire disasters? So let's drop back and recognize that wildfires are inevitable. And since severe weather conditions are inevitable, they come together at times. So extreme wildfires are inevitable. So does this mean wildland urban fire disasters are inevitable? And I give you a resounding no in answer to that. So given the best available science for understanding how homes ignite, wildland urban fire destruction during an extreme wildfire hazard is a readily preventable human disaster. Why am I distinguishing that? Well, because philosophically, number one, all problems are human problems because we're the only ones that write philosophy and, and file grievances. But maybe less trivially, we have by and large created this condition by which that disaster occurs. Not only are we increasing the chances of extreme fire behavior as, as an exposure to our communities, but we're building without any recognition that the vulnerability, the ignition vulnerability of our communities are very much the key to the disaster occurrence. So wildland urban fire science reveals opportunities for preventing wildland urban fire disasters without necessarily controlling extreme wildfires. Well, is the ability to prevent wildland urban fire disasters without controlling wildfires consistent with how we think wildland urban fire disasters occur? So visualize total destruction. Do we visualize that total destruction occurring because of the community or because of some perception of superheated gases rolling through the community? Well. So the perceptions that are exp expressed in media interviews in that we absolutely have to control wildfires. The fire storm descended like a dragon from hell on the foothill neighborhoods and laid them to waste. That is a great description of a natural disaster, not a human disaster. The wildfire swept through the community with a tsunami of flame the wildfire literally exploded houses in flames, leaving destruction in its path. It was like a war zone. Well, now we're definitely victims. And now we look 
at Paradise, California after it burned during the campfire. And very quickly after that, I got calls from starting with journalists that I know. And the question became, can you explain the unusual pattern of destruction? Well, can you define, explain the unusual pattern of destruction in this scene? And my immediate response is this is the typical pattern of destruction, but because of high definition drone photography and videography in paradise after it occurred, we now begin to see from the canopy down at the total destruction, not at the level of the destruction. So when we look at this kind of total destruction, our existing perception is tsunami of flame rolls through the area, leaving the community in waste. People see what they believe and ignore all the unburned material sitting around this community that is perceived as being the source of the superheated gases and certainly would be involved in superheated gases. So typical patterns of wildland urban fire destruction do not support walls of flame sweeping through communities and wildfires literally don't explode houses in flames. So when we take a look at this scene, 1993 from Laguna, California, just down coast from where you are, if you're in LA, when we look at this, we see a single house that has survived. This house survived without protection and soon became known as the Miracle House. But when we look at this scene, what else didn't burn? By the way, we're not looking at any wildland here really, except way up in the far top off into the smoke. This is all development. This is all suburban Southern California. So what else didn't burn in this scene? Well, the vegetation, the miracle vegetation between the destruction, between the streets of destruction. And when we look at this scene, these houses ignited from lofted burning embers from fire brands, not wildfire flames. And in fact, the wildfire actually never spread to contact this community. When we look at Los Alamos in 2000, we see total destruction surrounded by unassumed tree canopies. When we look a little closer on one of the streets in Los Alamos, in Northwestern Los Alamos, we see total destruction next to green vegetation. When we look at these photos and we look central in the photos, we see a split rail wood fence where surface fire, fire that spread in the litter, the pine needles and branches under that wood fence without igniting and destroying it to ignite these houses. Let's take a look at a, at a video clip that shows this location, this street and its neighbors of this photo on fire when it was happening. So here we are, homes burning hours after the wildfire passed the community. This is on the order of about two and a half hours after the wildfire passed the community. It took that long for surface fire spreading off the intense wildfire to spread on the surface down through a canyon back up and actually make contact with those houses. So the intense wildfire never spread to the residential area. These houses are burning, but obviously not from or with the tree canopy. So typically home ignitions result from lofted burning embers that can either ignite the home directly or ignite 
surface fires, low intensity surface fires spreading around the house to contact, directly contact the house. So when we see unconsumed tree canopies amid total destruction, this indicates that wildfire flames did not spread through the community. Burning trees did not ignite the homes and the trees, the tree canopies that are consumed in this scene adjacent to and over the home were destroyed, were ignited by the burning house and then burned with the burning house. When we go to Victoria, Australia, the Melbourne fires in 2009, this is Kings Lake, just uh, in, inland from Melbourne. It's, it tends to be a somewhat cooler bedroom community and also a resort area. It was very hot during that period, high temperatures, um, well over 40 Celsius. And yet what we see here are eucalypt canopies, several species of eucalyptus, unconsumed with total destruction within the community. And 2017 in Napa during the, the Atlas, uh, yeah, during the Atlas fire, we see this kind of destruction. Or in 2018 during the car fire, or in 2020 in California and Oregon, and last year in Lytton, British Columbia, Canada. This is currently a, a study that I'm doing on the destruction of Lytton. What you see here in this photo was initiated, this destruction was initiated by grass burning and light shrubs. As you can see, the tree canopies within and bordering community are unconsumed. So commonly communities burn by fire spreading through residential fuels, the vegetation and structures within the community. Homes ignite and burn hours after significant wildfire activity has ceased at the community edge. The community continues to burn without the wildfire. It is now spreading through community flammables. When we look at this scene, the intense wildfire spread past this particular community at about 2.30 in the afternoon. This is South Lake Tahoe. And when we see where the fire spread off the side of this fire spreading, we see that it spread on the surface. Actually, where the red arrows are was what is called a fuel treatment. They had thinned out this canopy to increase its resilience as well as to make it easier for this stand of trees to, to survive, to be vigorous. Well, that surface fire spread to make contact with the first roughly 10 houses on the wildland side of the residential area. Those houses ignited, contributed burning embers, lofted into the rest of the community. So between 3.30 and 5, the fire spread within the community and ended where the community ended. So when we look at destruction adjacent to survival, what do unconsumed vegetation and homes adjacent to total destruction indicate? It indicates that wildfire does not spread through a community like a lava flow, flash flood, or tsunami that explodes houses in flame, leaving total destruction in its wake. Intense, simultaneous heating across wide areas of structures does not occur. However, having said that, the role of the wildfire is to indeed simultaneously over wide areas initiate ignitions, not with flames necessarily, but with burning embers, as well as on the edge of the community, potentially flames igniting houses. But 
in all of that, it's the local conditions that determine home ignitions. When we see total destruction, it does not indicate high intensity wildfire exposures. This scene is because there were no available firefighters or homeowners to put out to extinguish the small ignitions. So the ignition sustained and freely burned the house to total destruction. Although initiated largely by embers from intense wildfires, burning residential fuels, the homes and the vegetation continued fire spreading within the community. So let's pause for a moment and ask ourselves, well, we're talking about fire. So very quickly, what really are we talking? Are we talking about a thing when we're thinking about fire? Well, no, about meeting the requirements for combustion, ignitions, and thus fire does not occur without meeting these requirements for combustion, the fuel, the heat, and in this particular case, oxygen is always available, always ample for supporting an ignition and fire. So fire is a process, it's not a thing. It's a process that happens one step at a time, one fuel ignition at a time. Wildfire spreads when ignition requirements are met at adjacent fuel during wildfires, including even these kinds of wildfires, extreme wildfires, high intensity wildfires. It happens faster and at a smaller scale than what we perceive, because we can't get very close to this. And yet the fact of the matter is that Everywhere fire goes, you can be assured that it met the requirements for combustion. It didn't roll along. So the requirements for combustion occur very locally at the fuel surface. Now the conditions may be at various distances, but the requirements are not met somewhere away from the fuel. It's met at the fuel. Fire is not a thing that travels from place to place like tsunami floods and other natural hazards. That's an important distinction, by the way, because we can't address local conditions of our house and avoid a flood or a tornado or a hurricane. But we do have considerable leverage over the processes of ignition and fire. And that provides us opportunities to prevent wildland urban fire disasters. Well, so now when we consider wildland urban fire, that is a structure or home ignition problem, now suddenly we change our perspective from wildfire where the fuel is that vegetation and now the fuel are the structures, are the homes and the heat that needs to be sufficient in order to ignite that home are all the burning materials on and adjacent to the homes. And again, oxygen is always sufficient for ignitions in this case. So that takes us back, and I've been calling the problem the wildland urban fire issue, as opposed to wildland urban interface, which is inherently a geographic classification. It basically, this word, this term interface begins to associate geographically the wildland with the urban or perhaps intermix or whatever other variation we might use of a geographic classification. But this geographic classification does not determine home ignitions. It's the requirements for combustion. Yes, we have wildfire or the wildland initiating the community, and it is a profound uh, source of simultaneous, numerous simultaneous ignitions within the community, initiating 
the community fire, the urban, to burn. So both of these terms are important in wildland urban fire, but the condition, the actual ignition leading to destruction are determined by local conditions. So local conditions were not sufficient for ignition in the case of this house where high intensity fire had burned to and passed. And in this particular case, local conditions were sufficient for ignition to occur of this house and its outbuildings without high intensity fire burning in the vegetation path to and past. So that prompts the question, how far is local? And what conditions principally determine conditions during extreme wildfires? So that required research. So using modeling experiments and disaster examinations, those approaches resulted or indicated, determined, that the characteristics of a home in relation to burning materials in the immediate surroundings within 30 meters of a house and its flammable attachments principally determine home ignitions during extreme wildfires. And 30 meters, particularly in the modeling, is an intended overestimate. So in this, this research approach, the first thing I did was modeling. Then I did experiments to examine the modeling to essentially verify and validate the modeling, basically verify that the model was computing properly and computing the proper relationships and then validating based on a comparison with reality, with experiments, both laboratory as well as field full-scale field experiments, like the crown fire, the burning canopies in the center photo. And then, and actually this is out of order, actually when I was doing examinations of fires, even before I started the formal research, that was creating questions that I was asking when I started this research approach. So the overestimate by and large comes from not wanting to underestimate a distance from the results of the research. Well, so how can 30 meters be an overestimate? You know, the firefighters have asked me this question, really? 30 meters is an overestimate? How, how can you say that? Actually, in the US, firefighters say 100 feet, but, but more to the point, 30 meters. And I asked, and this is particularly after doing other research on what it takes for human burn exposure for quantifying firefighter safety zones, my response is, how would we know if 30 meters is an overestimate. And the reason for that is because human skin sensitivity to thermal pain and injury is much greater than the heating requirements for piloted wood ignition. And what I mean by piloted wood ignition is I heat up the wood with a radiant source. It starts decomposing it. The temperature goes up. It absorbs the energy, the radiation. The temperature goes up to a point of where the cellulose that, that sugar polymer begins to decompose, producing flammable vapors, mixing with the oxygen in the air, and then with a small spark or small flame, I can actually ignite that flammable mixture. That's the piloted ignition. Well, so my skin sensitivity isn't related to the amount of heating that is required to produce those flammable vapors from the wood decomposition. So for example, a flame radiative exposure on my exposed skin that produces a second degree burn in five seconds takes over 27 minutes to pilot ignite a wood wall. And 27 minutes in relation to how much time it takes for the fire in the background 
to consume the fine fuels that are producing the large flames that you see, that burns out at one single location in about 30 seconds. And the whole thing, if it doesn't move on, is over in terms of its high intensity burning in just a few minutes. So 27 minutes is a massive amount of time. What that means, the bottom line to all of this, is that human perception of ignition requirements is not reliable. I would call that an understatement. It's not even in the same universe. It's not even relevant. So here I am <clears throat> post fire where an interview with firefighters in this particular location that had engaged with the houses that are out of scene on the right that we'll see in a moment, disengaged when what we see here on the left became a high intensity fire, they disengaged for safety reasons. Okay, so here on the lower right diagonal of the photo is where that high intensity occurred. They pulled out with the impression that went, so these houses were not burning when they left, although they didn't get back for several hours. Okay, so their impression is that that high intensity ignited those houses. So then I'm, we're doing the investigation and we find out that the, uh, that the total distance of, or well, I should say the closest distance of this totally destroyed house to where these big flames were was a little greater than 30 meters. And then we continued to look around the property and found out that a post on this wood fence that survived was about 14 meters away. And when we started taking a close look at this fence, we found out that there was no char. There was no thermal decomposition of the wood on this fence, particularly on this post that was facing the high intensity burning. Now, we also see the scorched leaves, the dead leaves on the trees or on, on the shrubs, these, these rose bushes. And as it turns out, the amount of heat to create or to kill these leaves is essentially the same threshold as what it takes to produce a second degree burn on our exposed stem. So the opportunity to reduce fuels within 30 meters of a home to discontinue intense fire spread to the house, prevent ignitions from intense radiant heating, and prevent surface fire flames from spreading continuously to contact the flammable parts of the home is possible without necessarily controlling the wildfire. And in this particular case, this home didn't need wildfire suppression for its survival. So home ignitions during extreme wildfires are principally determined by the ignition characteristics of a home in relation to burning objects within 30 meters of a home. And this area is called the home ignition zone, or if you prefer, the structure ignition zone. Let's take a look at a stylized view of this home ignition zone and look at it in terms of the ignition potential from the hazards. And then we'll look at the ignition potential contributed by the vulnerabilities to ignition. Those hazards present an exposure that given vulnerabilities result in ignition. So the home ignition zone, by definition, anything, any burning material beyond 30 meters from the house and its flammable attachments is outside the home ignition zone. And the research has determined that those flames do not 
threaten, cannot meet the requirements for combustion on the flammable materials of the house. And so that means that only radiation, the radiant heat coming out of the burning fire, since it's more than a 30 meters away, is what the heat transfer is to the house. That is the hazard. And, and most notably, and the firebrands, the burning embers from all those burning things, structures and you know, the rest of the community, parts of the community and the burning vegetation. So now as we approach the house, the importance of fire and the burning characteristics is graded between two zones and something that is, and a zone that is actually in contact with the base of the structure. So between 10 and 30 meters, we have a situation where we can tolerate considerably more fire than we can in zone one. Notice on the photo here on the upper right that there are the, the non-combustion zone right next to the house, then zone one that is between one and a half and 10 meters, and then 10 meters to 30 meters. And the whole point here is that we can tolerate more and more flame as we go away from the house. Now, we don't want high intensity in that 10 to 30 meter zone. And we're actually using that 10 to 30 meter zone to, to reduce the intensity of whatever is going on beyond there. Anything beyond the home ignition zone, any treatment of the wildland that we do beyond that 30 meter zone is essentially for the resilience of our forest and our vegetation not necessarily to prevent the house from burning down. In the non-combustion zone that I have here at last, the zero to one and a half meter area should have no ignitable material that can ignite and support either smoldering or flaming combustion that can contact flammable parts of the house. The ignition vulnerabilities are now responding to whatever the hazard is. So when we talk about the home ignition zone, it's the home characteristics, it's ignition characteristics in relation to the rest of the home ignition zone, the surrounding burning materials, and the burning embers that may be coming in from beyond 30 meters. So the home and flammable attachments adjacent to and a and above this non-combustion zone. So I'm talking about the house now, the walls, windows, attachments, and entryways, attachments being boardwalks and decks, and other assembly junctions. Eaves and under eaves and the roof covering and other features. And we're going to look at this a little bit more in a moment. So that was a stylized home ignition zone. Here, example. So here's a house that was exposed to high intensity burning and was and there was insufficient flame heating and the house was ember, ember resistant such that it survived without protection. So typically extreme wildfires don't spread into developed neighborhoods. So what I'm talking about here now is not an individual house like in the prior scene, but rather where we have houses developed on the order of uh, a density greater than one per hectare, one per half a hectare and greater. So here we have development where a high intensity crown fire is spreading in from the right side, the house on the wild, the houses, the row on the wildland side become essentially engulfed. 
in the crown fire, they have high intensity flame contact, they're gone. But when we look at this break, this residential break, we see that the crown fire was not capable of continuing, of igniting the opposing canopy and continuing into the rest of the community. Just with a gap, a residential street gap, producing a 12 meter gap between tree canopies. So does that mean that fuel breaks work? Well, no, because when we look at what happened, we have total destruction of the rest of the community for another two and a half blocks to where it quit at the state highway without Crown Fire. It was burning essentially from the initiation of the Crown Fire, not from flames, but burning embers, and then continued to burn after that initiation. So burning embers are a principal ignition mechanism. This is the Woolsey Fire. This is a photo from the Woolsey Fire, which was in 2018 during the, roughly the same time as the, the campfire and the paradise destruction back in 2018. Uh, that would have been November 8th, 2018. Well, so burning embers are inevitable during extreme wildfires, but don't embers come from beyond the home ignition zone? And the answer is, well, yes, Embers commonly ignite structures and vegetation within communities at distances of a kilometer or more during extreme wildfire conditions. And of course, this varies based on the type of vegetation. However, it doesn't matter from how far the burning embers are lofted, they only generate home ignitions at locations of accumulation within the home ignition zone and especially on the house, but we should not disqualify the, the, the surrounding home ignition zone because those burning embers can generate ignitions within the home ignition zone around the house and potentially spread fire to contact the house. So again, it's the home characteristics in relation to the burning objects in the rest of the home ignition zone. So let's take a look at some at ember ignition experiments that demonstrate how embers without a flame zone, without big flames, can generate ignitions, produce fire that then contact this structure. So we have this full scale structure inside our burning lab at the in Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety in Southern, uh, in South Carolina. Those gutters are PVC filled with pine needles, aluminum gutters, and another section of polyvinyl chloride gutter material, plastic gutters. We have pine needle debris in the valley of the asphalt composition shingle roof covering. We have pine needle mulch and bark mulch within one and a half meters around the base of the walls. We have vinyl siding, fiber cement. This is essentially, in this case, they were uh, uh, cellulose fibers, wood fibers, but it's in a cement uh, uh, base. And then on this side, fiber composition board, which is made out of pressed wood fiber. And here we have are ember generators and exposure. And almost immediately you see an ignition in the pine needle debris next to the wall. What's happening here is the generated burning embers are hitting the wall and falling down into and accumulating into the pine needles and very quickly igniting. And notice how many ignitions are beginning to occur around and on this house. Now, this brand exposure, if you remember the introductory slides of the 
the eddy coming out over the road berm and the swirl of burning embers in that one photo and the blizzard of embers with the two guys um, uh, fighting fire, the two residents fighting fire, this exposure is not worst case. Certainly it's representative for about 40 seconds to a minute, but it doesn't last as long as we would get from real exposures. And yet, look at the flame generation we got without. So the wildfire is not there. There is no wildfire. This is only burning embers that initiates ignitions on an adjacent. If this house was in real life, it likely would not have been protected and it would have been totally destroyed. So residential fuels, burning structures and adjacent vegetation are also significant sources of embers that continue community fire spread hours after significant wildfire exposures have ceased. This is another mechanism the, the community itself that's burning generates ignitions for the rest of the community. And so here is, this is on the last night, actually early morning of the 2003 fire siege in Southern California. This was the Cedar Fire down in San Diego County. This is the end of the Cedar Fire. And we can see from the structures, those were two burning structures that generated this shower of burning embers and we can see as they hit this water tender them breaking up so they're pretty good size when they get there so wild and urban disaster fire disasters do not occur from a tsunami of flame sweeping through the community houses do not literally explode in flames it is not a war zone and dragon from hell dragons from hell are not to blame so how do wildland urban fire disasters occur? Well, let's start with severe fire conditions. Then given an ignition, we develop or is developed rapid fire spread and or high intensities. So it doesn't necessarily have to happen this way. We can have an ignition and a, a lower intensity wildfire, a slower spreading wildfire, and then severe fire conditions to produce that extreme fire behavior, the rapid spread and, and or high intensities. And then, and only then, if we have a development that is exposed, multiple simultaneous ex, uh, exposures can generate ignitions in vulnerable homes and buildings. This, well, the wildfire has already overwhelmed fire suppression. It's already a fire, an extreme wildfire that can't be controlled. And now with the extensive exposure of the community, fire protection is overwhelmed by the ignition exposure. Many houses start burning. And so then there's less attention to the burning houses. And that means most houses go without attention. They're burning without attention to total destruction and the disaster. Wildland urban fire disasters have only occurred during extreme wildfire conditions when wildfire suppression was ineffective and structure fire protection was overwhelmed. Well, so how do we attempt to prevent wildland urban fire disaster? What's our approach today? Well, with wildfire suppression and emergency response, and that fails to prevent wildland urban fire disasters during extreme conditions. The inevitability of extreme wildfire conditions and our inability 
to control extreme wildfire suggest inevitable wildland urban fire disasters. However, what we have just seen is that the home ignition zone conditions primarily determine home ignitions during extreme wildfires. The total destruction commonly starts with small ember ignitions on and adjacent to the home that can be readily prevented, not necessarily during the exposure, but prior to where we eliminate the vulnerabilities to ignition on and around the house. So now when we come back to our disaster sequence, we have the inevitable extreme wildfire, but now we don't have houses that ignite and certainly not like they do when they're highly vulnerable. And what that does, we still can't control the wildfire, but now the task of protecting how buildings in the community is not overwhelmed. We can address the ignitions that do occur and we don't have a disaster. This gives us the leverage at the local area to prevent the wildland urban fire disaster. We can make homes and communities ignition resistant by eliminating and reducing ignition factors within the home ignition zone. And therefore, wildland urban fire is a home ignition problem, not a problem of controlling extreme wildfire. We can make homes ignition resistant during extreme wildfires by eliminating ignitions from flames within the home ignition zone and reducing ignitions of the home. So remember, home ignitions during extreme wildfires are a local combustion process determined by local conditions within the home ignition zone, not a geographic classification like interface or intermix. Ignition resistant homes are characteristic of, they don't have flammable debris on the home and it's flammable attachments. They do not have any ignitable material within five feet of the home and it's flammable attachments. And by the way, that flammable material is not freshly grown geraniums or roses or any other plants that we might want to beautify our landscape but we need to make sure that when spring comes or whenever that we don't have dead material and we don't have flammable mulch in that location. We just have well irrigated green plants without dead material. So we don't have to live in a stark parking lot and bunker. The characteristics of a, an ignition resistant home include not having flame contact from within the home ignition zone. What that says is we don't have to have, we don't have to eliminate all potential fire burning in the home ignition zone, but that fire can't lead, can't produce intensities and durations that will be sufficient to ignite the house. We do not have high intensity burning within the home ignition zone. And that's primarily, that's not only due to this, this first ten, uh, uh, one and a half to 10 meter area, it's also very much to do with the 10 to 30 meter area. Burning embers become the only ignition mechanism from beyond the home ignition zone during a wildfire exposure. So let's take a look at the potential ignition factors or examples, that's a better way to put it, examples of ignition factors of a home. So in this particular case, we're looking at, just for example, a wood rail fence with a stack of firewood next to the wood rail fence that is then goes and is connected to flammable wood siding on the home. And oh, by the way, 
look at the pine needles in the gutters of this garage in the scene. Okay, so let's take a look at the roof of a house to the eaves. And we're only going to be looking essentially at the house and its vulnerability. Because now we talked about closure as not being this house. Essentially, we're now talking about the vulnerability of the house, not the hazard, not, not the hazard exposure. Okay. Well, so let's get the worst case example out of the way first. Although new fire retardant pressure treated wood can be effective, it can resist ember ignitions. However, as that wood roof ages, its effectiveness declines. And it's not absolutely sure, it's not well defined when that wood roof at 15, 20, 30, 40 years begins to support ignitions. And typically you can't determine the ignitability of an ignising roof, existing roof without taking a sample. So we need to assume that all wood roofs are ignitable if the fire retardancy is unknown. And when we look at the results, what we see, this is uh, during the Cedar Fire in 2003, a house in what in the neighborhood called Scripps Ranch, we see <clears throat> spot ignitions out here in dead material on the surface. And we see direct ignitions on this flammable wood roof here, here, and here on this flammable roof. But what we don't see are any ignitions on this composition shingle roof. What about sprinklers on wood roofs? Will that help? Well, the problem with that is that we have uncertain opportunities for effective act activation and effectiveness of the roof because frequently we don't get a sprinkler to wet under the structure areas and openings from eaves and, and niches. So active, taking an active approach to preventing home ignition is and perhaps an enhancement for the passive ignition resistance that we've already generated or created on our house, of our house, of our home ignition zone. And oh, by the way, spraying water, if we can get it on there for a while, is definitely a water damage problem. So what about a non-combustible roof covering? So here we have the Spanish tile, the U-shaped tile. But when we look at modified form of Spanish tile, we see that they haven't bird stopped on the edges. So this is a class A roof covering, but it's not ignition resistant. It's not resistant to embers penetrating underneath the tiles where there may be debris from rodents and birds that can then generate ignitions on the subsheathing under that non-flammable material. And here's an example of that, where the non-combustible tile roof was penetrated on the edges and particularly up here at the ridge cap by burning embers. Here's a composition shingle roof, an asphalt, fiberglass asphalt composition shingle roof with pine needles in the valley and pine needles in the gutter. And so you can ask the question, where are these pine needles a problem? Well, if we look at in the valley on this composition shingle roof, we have a burn off and by these needles that are there in the photo were from after the fire coming off of the trees that didn't consume. There was fire damage to the shingles, but no shingle fire spread or burn through to the subsheathing of the roof. But when we look at this kind of pine needle deposition, which by the way, is not all that common in heavily forested communities, 
we see the potential for burning ember ignitions, a rain gutter filled with dry pine needle debris at the beginning of a simulated firebrand shower. And then 40 seconds later, we see heavy involvement of the pine needles in the rain gutters. So ignition from firebrands that lead to this kind of damage where we see partial damage thanks to some very um, gutsy fire protection from firefighters. Where we have comp complex roof geometries, there are locations where we have a vertical, potentially wood wall, like in this case, next to a roof surface, which is essentially like having that wood wall down on the ground surface with pine needle mulch or pine needle debris. This is a readily available area for ignition, primarily because the eave line protects and keeps that area, frequently keeps that area dry if there was any precipitation earlier. And this is what we get. And when we look at the possibility of having a little bit of pine needle deposition, but in within a neighborhood, we can get much larger burning embers from sheathing pieces off of a burning house that's not necessarily very far away. And here we have a wood chimney chase with damage. We see that from the street and we say, wait a second, that looks very much like protection damage, not fire damage. So we go up and inspect it and lo and behold, what we see is where burning ember burning embers and potentially a, a large burning ember has landed right where the roof has come up to and back at this intersection, this inside corner between the roof and this cedar wood chimney chase. This flashing that has been exposed by the fire destruction was on the inside. Notice that everywhere where there wasn't fire destruction, we see wood all the way to the roof surface. This flashing, this metal flashing is for water. All we have to do is extend the height of that flashing, cut a reveal, not, essentially don't have the wood go down to the surface of the roof. And now all of a sudden we begin to generate a non-flammable inside corner that can't ignite. And this is what happens when fires don't get there in time. So when we're talking about screens on vents, we need to recognize that all screening needs to be metal, three millimeter mesh, or louvered openings to prevent and reduce the likelihood of firebrand entry. So in all cases, we need to have three millimeter mesh, quarter or six millimeter mesh and plastic screen is not nearly as effective. So what about under eave areas? Well, <clears throat> so what we see on the right are eaves that have had exposure from the radiation from flames. The first comment that I'll make is that no eaves are not necessarily better than extended eaves when it comes to fire. And in fact, these eaves, as we see from the evidence, have actually shaded the under eave portion that makes the under eave area actually cooler until of course the wall catches on fire, which is typical of the responding firefighters experience. But if the wall is on fire, then we haven't prevented the ignition of the house and nobody's likely to be there. And enclosed eaves, softened or box, are not necessarily better than open eaves. However, here's my caution. An enclosed eave allows you to have 
and attic ventilation that is a great deal more ember resistant than block venting in with open eaves. So we have vinyl enclosures. We need to be quite careful that we don't have surface fire that can melt off the vinyl panels and leave unscreened openings into the attic. So what about wall areas? Well, here we have an example of a vinyl sided wall and a fiber cement sided wall. And what we see is that the vinyl isn't necessarily the problem with regard to fire. It has, it will spread vertically if it's maintained by flaming combustion. But what has happened here is that the fire was burning low, it melted off the vinyl that separated it from the fire, but then there was fire in contact with the subsheathing plywood in this particular case. In, with the fiber cement, it stays in place. It's non-flammable. There is no burning and no char. When we look at this interface <clears throat> on the right, is where the vinyl siding was and the plywood subsheathing, and on the left is where the fiber cement was. So definitely fiber cement is highly available in building supply stores and it is non-flammable. <clears throat> Plate glass windows. Plate glass thermally fractures at heat exposures less than necessary for wood ignition. Dual pane assemblies provide some increased protection. And size matters. Plate glass picture windows greater than roughly one to one by one and a half meters readily collapse, spontaneously co collapse after fracture, thermal fracturing. What about tempered glass windows? Well, tempered glass is a very good option for, for window treatments. The same material, it's the same physical composition of glass as plate glass, but it's been heat treated to increase its impact and thermal resistance. So tempered glass commonly fractures at or after heat exposures that are sufficient for piloted wood ignition. So it's as resilient as the wood wall. And the wood wall is not highly vulnerable to ignition without flame contact. And tempered glass for many applications is code required, such as walking surfaces and glass within a vertical height of walking surfaces. And it's a really good idea where people are going to be around very large glass surfaces to prevent serious injury from breakage. And it's indicated by an etching in one of the corners. Flammable materials on adjacent to and attached to or under the home are a really bad idea. So when we talk about decks, the large dimensional material of decks, particularly posts and joist material, tend not to sustain combustion, even with flame contact. The large material cannot, there cannot be enough heat transferred into the material to sustain the ignition. So what do we have? Well, we have furniture, flammable furniture on the decks. So here's an example of a wood deck where we have flammable furniture. When we take a closer look, this deck ignited from, and we're looking through the back of a flammable cushion on this patio furniture. So the deck actually ignited from the flammable material on the deck. When we look at inside corners, firebrands can collect in these inside corners, whether they're 
cube corners like in the upper left or a linear corner like in the upper right. We also, where there's complex geometry, parallel wood materials where facing boards are and junctions of balusters and rails with deck boards and ignition that enhances the geometry that then can sustain the ignition of a pile of firebrands, as opposed to even on this well-weathered deck, we can't sustain where we have the, the junctions underneath the deck. So these char spots resulted from relatively large burning embers, likely from other structures from houses that span the gaps between the deck boards, but the heat losses are too great on the horizontal deck boards to sustain the ignitions. However, in these corners, that can happen. Interestingly, in this particular case, we see where the burning embers collected in that corner, but there was the vertical surfaces were covered with non-combustible metal flashing. When we go to the other side, the opposite side of this entrance, we see where there were there was enhanced geometry from the deck boards parallel to and meeting into this corner, and the firebrands collected there, ignited, but likely could not sustain uh, combustion once the area opened up. And that's thanks to the metal flashing on the vertical surface. Here, we have a situation where that zero to one and a half meter zone had flammable material. It wasn't mulch, it was just pine needle and leaf debris. These leaves are after the fire burned. And what we see is that the wood trim that was right at where the surface was burning potentially could have sustained. It didn't, but notice that where the masonry is, the rock, there isn't a problem. And just a little bit, we can see the gradient of thermal decomposition as we go from the right corner of the window frame and go to the left and we begin to see the diminishing exposure due to the surface burning. Ignite and can burn to the house if they're attached. The recommendation there is have a wood fence, but then have a non-flammable break at the house. The zero to five foot, uh, one and a half foot meter zone is absolutely the most vulnerable location where burning embers can ignite flammable material like, like mulches and pine needle debris and dead uh, vegetation material. And of course our favorite friend, the, the junipers that have a nice green canopy covering a huge mass of dead material that can ignite from burning embers, particularly if we have wood chip uh, uh, mulch. And then we have a house that has a push out where when this burns, it can put flame right directly under the push out, the bay window on the right side. Otherwise, it actually, without the junipers, even the mulch, but about a foot and a half of concrete footer before the wood starts, is actually fairly resistant. Well, what about fire codes, building fire codes? Commonly, fire codes designate fire performance rather than ignition performance. It designates materials and designs that flow, slow flame spread and therefore they're rated in accordance with the, the flame spread, not ignited 
So extended time wall ceiling and door fire penetration hour ratings are also another example of where, no, there's a fire burning, but what we're doing is we're limiting the spread of that fire from one compartment into another. These are typical building, interior building fire codes. But they don't prevent wildland urban fire disasters. Why? Because when we look at the wildland urban fire, we find out that, that there is no fire response to most homes. So fire performance codes that facilitate fire control by reducing interior fire involvement rates, they assume firefighter response. Without that firefighter response, the house just takes longer to be totally destroyed. So what we want is to, if we're going to have fire codes, what we want are ignition performance codes that eliminate most ignitions, not fire performance codes that tell us the spread rate within a structure. So the codes that, that would be made and to some extent, California 7A wildland, wildland or wildfire codes do this, but the codes need to be appropriate for the wildland urban fire context, a fire, an ignition performance context to be beneficial. So an example of, of this would be in urban conflagration of high density developments. So in urban conflagration and high density development, we have structure to structure spread. The wildfire isn't anywhere close to here at this point, and it has since initiated and burned out upwind of this community. And the result is, this is these are two different incidents. Um, the one that you saw just prior, this one is in Colorado, near Colorado Springs, and this one is, is Coffee Park after the Tubbs fire. And what we see here are an opportunity potentially to, to reduce the potential for this kind of urban conflagration with non-flammable facing walls, essentially non-flammable exterior cladding on on structures, lim very limited to no window space between structures. And when I say non-flammable cladding, you can now buy the fiber cement siding and trim boards for the exterior of a house. They are non-flammable. So in the case of extreme overlapping home ignition zones, the physics of ignition doesn't change, but the social dynamics becomes critical. At this point, you don't control, you share your home ignition zone, which means that you need your neighbors to also be conscious of ignition resistance. So making our homes ignition resistant means having wildfires and ecological disturbance without wildland urban fire disasters. Thank you very much. And that's it. Thank you, Jack. Thank you so much. Um, we really appreciate the presentation. It's uh, super compelling. Um, uh, and um, the, the material um, points to a lot of different opportunities for architects. So we really appreciate it. Um, one, one question, um, if everyone could turn on their video, that would be really helpful so that Jack could uh, to see who you guys are. Um, Jack, one, one question that we have had is that given all the fires in Sonoma and Napa, um, it, it seems like such a um, easy thing to, for those counties to recommend fire resistant materials in new construction. Um, do you see that happening in um, high risk fire zones? 
I'm not sure quite how to answer this question civilly. Um, and it doesn't have I, to be civil. <laughs> yeah, I have to be civil. Okay. Um, I don't think there's enough appreciation. And let me let me say that we have we seem to be getting conflicting messages because we get fire agencies. And so if we're talking about uh, federal agencies or that do wildfire or even um, Cal Fire that does both, right? By, by California constitution, they, they are chartered to, to have fire protection on structures within each county. And they also do wildfire protection. And we, one of our huge problems, and here's where I'll stay civil, because the alternative here is in stepping back and, and recognizing that our greatest practical, most effective leverage in preventing the ignitions is with ignition resistance with an approach that I'll define as a structure ignition approach, not a wildfire control approach. Because if we look, if we empirically examine the situation of the wildfire and the community disaster, fire disaster, we find out that the common response from firefighters, wildland firefighters, fire protection is there's nothing that we could have done. Hmm. And what they're talking about is the wildfire problem, the hazard that's exposing the vulnerable community. So in essence, one of the reasons I think that we're so hobbled in effective response is that we continually define the problem as a wildfire problem, as a wildfire control problem. And oh yeah, the homeowners are supposed to go off there and do ignition resistance. Oh, they're supposed to clean up their houses. And it, it tends to be an afterthought from what firefighters do, which is response. Mm -hmm. And it's abundantly clear that we have decades of empirical evidence that re emergency response is not effective when the disasters occur. Yep. So, so we need to step back and from a, an intellectually honest standpoint and a perhaps a humble standpoint, and I would say a non-firefighting culture standpoint and say, wait a second, we can't deal with this situation. We can't be protective under these conditions of both the extreme wildfire and the highly vulnerable community. Mm. So now what we tend not to recognize in general as government organizations, state, local, and federal, is what we have are two separable problems, one of which is fire as a natural disturbance in our landscapes, or let me say an appropriate disturbance in our landscapes, which is a, a natural resource, a landscape management problem, and the separable problem of, oh, well, we have communities that are highly ignitable, and we can make them ignition resistant such that we can cope with fire as a disturbance in our landscape. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, have, we have to, in essence, what I'm getting at is by doing this redefinition, creating ignition resistant communities, we then facilitate the ability to do fire as an ecological factor in our landscapes. Does that make sense? Um, yes, absolutely, except for that last part. What does fire as an ecological factor 
right. in our landscapes, meaning that, so, that we so allow, much. we manage fire as a, a thing that's both valuable to the, the health of the, an environment, uh, a, a natural environment. Yeah, let me yeah. let me explain that statement. Uh, a few words for a um, a, a fairly potentially non-intuitive concept. So let me give you a, a moderately long answer, and that is that all of our landscapes, our ecosystems, um, where I live, was right next to a a. a 3,000 meter thick sheet of ice uh, roughly 15,000 years ago. So this location had none of the vegetation in it that is currently there. Not only that, but where I live was under a lake due to glacial blocking at least two dozen times, a, a 300 meter deep lake that periodically was there and not. And where I grew up in Southern Arizona, that landscape 12,000 years ago was like East Africa with elephants, hmm. uh, woolly mammoths and very large carnivores and other large omnivorous and herbivorous creatures, okay? That landscape also changed as the ice sheets melted and retreated. While that was happening, at least in this location where I live now in Montana, at least for the last 12,000 years, and where I grew up for 20,000 years, people were living there and lighting fires. There was also lightning that was lighting fires. So while all this vegetation was developing in that climate change after glaciation, there was fire that was selecting. It was a natural selection agent, a, an ecological factor that was shaping those ecosystems for the, the species that existed, the composition of the species that existed and the density that existed when European settlers got here and started extracting it and appreciating it or, and, and taking it for granted as an extractable resource. Got it. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So, so Basically, the situation we're in is violating the sustainability of that natural resource because it's here due to fire in its as an ecological factor. And we have completely subverted that with mm -hmm. our, our perceptions, expectations, and behaviors, not the least of which is motivated by communities burning up and we can get a, we can do away with that. And by the way, while I'm on a roll here, with climate change, a rapidly changing natural environment, the last thing in the world we want to do is to get in the way of our landscape adaptation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The plants, their composition and their density. The yeah. last thing we want to do is have this incredibly severe disturbance that takes away the ability to re-sprout, the ability for reseeding and regenerating, and for the survival of those sprouts and re-seedlings. Yep. Yep. Uh huh. Yeah. We. It's. Um, yeah. We. We. Um... I've done a little bit of research in the group about the um, about invasive species that are um, inhabiting areas after burns, not allowing natural species the time frame that's required um, to regrow, and and the that those invasive species oftentimes are much drier, more flammable, therefore making. Um, natural environments more susceptible 
to fires and that with climate change that, that um, in, the, in the glass fire area that we're seeing repetitive fires year after year, rather than the idea that fires will allow eventually um, an area to become healthier because of thinning. So yeah, it's a, the climate change, the factor of climate change seems to um, really take all bets off the table. Um, one question we had was, um, have you come across um, initiatives to use fire resistant 3D printed materials um, for houses? So, so let me repeat that. Have, do I have recommendation or know of fire resistant materials? Have, have you heard of companies that are trying to create 3D printed oh. fire resistant homes? Um, no, I haven't. Yeah. I, um, but I haven't looked either. Okay. Yeah. Um, that, that's an interesting thought. Um, I'm, I'm having trouble imagining a 3D printer the size of a sawmill, but, but that's, that's a, a really interesting um, idea. One, yeah. one of the things that I want to emphasize is we tend to think of wood as being a highly vulnerable material because it's flammable. But when we look at wood, not necessarily as a burning material, but as an igniting material, we begin to have a great deal more latitude hmm. where you can still have wood, but you have to begin, you have to avoid things like inside corners. So for example, a flat wood wall, a flat wood clad wall, even a, a nicely sealed uh, lap side wall, uh, it can't harbor, it can't accumulate burning embers until of course it gets to perhaps a flammable inside corner where that wood wall comes down to the wood deck plank, at which point we can address that inside corner and eliminate the flammable inside corner with flashing or just gaps where mm -hmm. the burning embers fall through to a non-flammable surface. Yeah. And I've done both on my own houses, um, uh, particularly my, my mountain um, cabin thing, um, where I actually have uh, grating within um, on the order of about uh, uh, five centimeters of the wood material. And the wood material is logs. So that now burning embers roll up against the logs. They're sitting on steel and then fall down through the coarse grating. It's yeah. not screen, it's, it's, it's a grating. It's like a mud scraping grating. I say, okay, great, fantastic. So um, yeah, I mean, I, I know it's sort of a random question to ask about 3D printing. The, the reason I ask is that, um, uh, that the, we, we, after your lecture last year, we thought about, well, you know, what role can architectural design have in fire resistant construction and one, idea is, is to, to um, upgrade homes in, in, um, in the way that you've recommended. So I don't know if you saw, but um, there was one thesis project last year that um, was based entirely upon the recommendations that you made and that there were two other projects that were done by Hitoshi's group that used the principles of um, creating a fire um, an HIZ um, set of boundaries. Um, so the 30, 30 meter boundary, and then the 10 meter boundary and the three meter boundary. And then on the other hand, one idea was could um, using a new type of material or, or non-conventional um, set of materials for house building be another way where um, fire resistance can happen in the HIZ. So, so we started to look 
at companies that do 3D printing with the idea that using a cementitious material um, uh, um, or clay might be a way to, to create homes that would be fire resistant, that wouldn't necessarily have things like eaves or wouldn't necessarily have um, uh, inside corners that are typical of wood construction. So that's, that's the whole reason. And, and so this year, that's something that we're exploring. Um, and it would be great to get your input on that at some point as, as we um, get into greater detail. So let me make a quick comment yes. about the idea of, of those kinds of like clay. So we're really talking about adobe kinds of, of construction. Uh, we're talking potentially stucco over hay bales, maybe, or, yeah. or, or even stick construction. Yeah, or rammed earth, yeah. Right. One of the things I want to interject here is that people live in these houses. <laughs> uh <-huh>. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> and what, what I'm implying there is that just because people live in the house, they begin to get more vulnerable because of the stuff that we have mm. around our houses. Now, maybe the walls are non-flammable, but we still have windows, plate glass windows, and maybe we have a carport. So now what I'm, as I'm talking, I'm doing a visualization of being in Greece in whenever the hell it was that I was in, 2003 was my first time to do some, some uh, Greek in, uh, uh, examinations mm. from disasters, okay? Mm. And, and so now we have a carport and now we have uh, firewood because it's kind of a second home out by the coast and uh, uh, near um, on, the, on the east side of, of Athens and so in the hills. And so now I have firewood stacked inside my carport next to my car with my windows. Mm -hmm. And that ignites, and when I get there, it's a shell of reinforced concrete. Mm. They put a wood frame roof on it because it's easier. The car is destroyed. There is no longer a wood pile. The house is gutted. And so one of the key, often missed points on houses burning during wildfires is that we continually look at the really big factors, the construction of the walls. Oh, it's flammable. Oh, that's bad. And we miss mm. the little things. We still have wood doors with uh, flammable plants there next to the glass plate glass windows mm -hmm. where the windows fracture fall out and then burning embers from vegetation oh. and other houses are blowing in to the interior of the house and there is a lot of time for this to happen because nobody's around they've all been evacuated mm. away and firefighter engagement unlike California where we have an enormous firefighter response capability for the population. I often say in presentations, it is the largest response capability in the galaxy. <laughs> so it kind, of, kind of makes it important that way. Yeah. And, and it's not capable of dealing with these little things because of the vulnerabilities in Greece or Spain, where we have masonry of whatever kind construction, mostly, mm -hmm. primarily because we don't have a lot of wood in Europe, in Southern Europe in particular, not Scandinavia, that's a different situation. I won't talk about them. Um, but now we have ignitions from different kinds of things. Got it. And so we need to, there are no set rules for 
one place applied to another because the little things change based on culture and availability of materials and culture drives behaviors and yep. vice versa. And Got so, so that's what I meant by, well, we have people living in these houses. Yep. Let Got me it. just tell you a quick story. Please. I, I was doing an investigation in South Lake Tahoe at the destruction um, from the Angora fire, not the most recent one, not, not um, uh, Dixie and, or um, I mean Calder. And, and when I was there, one of the things that I noticed with this group that I was with was the houses that had for sale signs on them tended to have a higher percentage survival rate than the other houses because they were cleaned up. They, they were cleaned up to mm. have curb appeal. Hmm. So all the stuff that was around them, you know, the piles of fire, or the firewood in the back and the lumber and the cardboard boxes under the decks were all removed. Wow. Okay. Fantastic, fantastic. It's a great story. Uh, yeah, a good lesson to always be selling your home. Um, <laughs> uh, do, do, uh, does anyone from the group um, have questions for Jack? Jack, please know that um, you're legendary already with uh, our studio. Part of the studio brief is, um, includes what we call the Jack Cohen paradox. Um, precisely the paradox that, that you, uh, you introduce as part of your thesis. So everyone knows who you are um, uh, because of that. Um, does, does, does anyone have questions for Jack? Well, I see a question that came up in the chat. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah we, um, you all can see it and I'll just read it. With more people moving into the fringes of wildland or interface for both aesthetic and economic reasons, do you see a contrast in how long-term and short-term residents deal with fire protecting their home, their homes because of culture clashes? Oh man. <laughs> I'm an engineer. How can I answer that? Um, are, are there systems in place to educate newer residents on how to fire protect their homes and maintain defensible buffer spaces and HIVs? Let me, let me, uh, God, there are so many facets on that question where I could be uncivil. Um, so one of the things that I tend not to do is hold residents as responsible as the firefighters telling them ultimately, uh, directly, explicitly or implicitly um, that the firefighters will protect them. Mm. My, uh, and this isn't a direct answer to the question, sort of. It, it's a, sort of along those, I guess, sociological, social, psychological and cultural um, tracks. How can we, I'll ask essentially a rhetorical question. How can we expect homeowners to be more responsible in their perspectives and activities than the firefighters who are maintaining their stance that if you just give them more money, they can build bigger suppression capabilities to solve the problem? One group is culture is a professional culture, and the other group are just residents, by and large, being waiting or behaving, in essence, as they are told explicitly or implicitly. So when a, a fire organization pulls up with a big fire truck in front of their house and is told to clean up their property, what are they supposed to think? And during a public meeting, when, when people are condemning, making pejorative comments about the fire department and the fact that they weren't able to save them, and the fire departments are telling them that, that they'll be there and protect them, I, I, I don't know where to start on the problem. And so 
I don't really see new residents being less knowledgeable and aware of the problem than old residents. Okay, having said that, it's abundantly clear that residents coming from, and I'll say this from the Montana standpoint, residents moving out of a highly urbanized location. So now we're talking, we're not talking about um, Santa Clara, Valencia, uh, or even the San Fernando, Simi Valley on up to uh, Oxnard or Malibu. I'm talking about deep in the heart of LA or Orange County where they heard about it, but they're essential, or New York City for that matter, moving to Western Montana and they have no idea what they're getting into. They don't even have an imagination for everything and wildfire. And I, I honestly don't know what to do about that. I have no idea how to deal with um, it's almost a bigger problem than how we can educate the people. And so they just find out about bears and lions and snow without removal and fire somewhere over there on the hillside. So, so I see the question as being I'll, let me just make the comment. I see the question as largely being more of a symptom than something that I can address with a solution. Good, good, great, okay. But I'll emphasize, don't expect residents to do better in their awareness than our firefighting agencies. Okay, good. Um, anyone else have a question for Jack? Hi, I had a question. Um, it is very interesting to see that the vegetation was not burned and the houses that got burned in some of the images that you showed. Uh, I wanted to ask, do you think that then these native species that do not get burnt in fire could be a potential solution to create fire breaks or wind breaks and like home uh, doing the necessary 30 meter parameters around your home and creating these essential vegetation breaks could go hand in hand to kind of uh, deal with the issues of fire and even if the issues of the, the ecosystem that has been lost due to climate change and the current fires. So can somebody um, relay that question? I wasn't I wasn't getting a, a real good audio. And yeah. my, my deepest apologies, if you want, if you can write it, um, go ahead and write it. But can anybody else? Um... Um, I'll, I'll just, I'll take a stab at it. Uh, yeah, I, I couldn't hear as well. But I think the, the gist of it was, are there fire resistant plants um, that could be used as a, type of fire break or defense um, uh, in, in a large scale way or in a repeatable, reproducible, scalable way? Is that pretty much, well, I'll answer that. And then- Bobby, is that it? Is that the, you your question? Yeah, I wanna satisfy your question. Okay. So, or do you wanna type it? So one of the, responses that I have when it comes to fire resistant plants and fire resistant plant lists. Uh, I tend not to, um, I, I don't discount them, but I tend not to endorse them. And here is my reason. Um, I can pretty much prune any plant to make it um, not necessarily aesthetically acceptable, but ignition resistant. Mm. Okay, and that's what I'm going to be after, ignition resistance, which means that, let me say, let, let, let me take a common landscaping plant, a juniper or an arbovitae, but I'll, I'll take a juniper. 
and typically our junipers like that one slide that I showed is full of dead material and underneath it is dead material that can then ignite both within the canopy as well as under the canopy and then ignite the green material in the canopy to produce a, a, temp, a relatively short-lived but relatively intense flame contact on the or exposure on the house. Well, does that mean that I can't make that plant ignition resistant? And yes, I can. I'll prune out all the dead material, remove all the dead material off the surface, and only have elevated green foliage in that plant, which means typically that each of those branches with foliage are rather separate. Well, that's a very different look and not every homeowner is interested in that. Okay, having said that, the plant lists need to have plants that don't produce dead material rapidly, mm. do not deposit lots of dead material underneath that plant. So what I'm getting at is these plants can't have a, the need for high maintenance to remove dead material. So on the list, there would be roses and let's say roses, because they don't put on a lot of dead material. And we should not have any organic mulch that they're bedded in, as opposed to junipers which we can make ignition resistant, but you may not like it. And it takes a lot of maintenance, yearly maintenance. Okay, so let me now go to <clears throat> a plant that would never be on a plant list and it's around all forested homes, Ponderosa pine. Hmm. I live, so if you live in a Ponderosa pine forest, I'm in Lake Tahoe. And when you go, there's a 200-year-old ponderosa pine sitting next to the house. <clears throat> if you were to take a strict view of an ignition-resistant plant, you would probably say, oh, well, you have to cut that down, at which point the resident says, you can leave my property now. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay? And my comment on that is, no, you don't. You don't have to cut that tree down. Oh, but by the way, because it's as close to your house as it is, are you aware that it might break off or fall down in a high wind and dissect your house? <laughs> are you aware of that? Okay, you're willing to accept that. Probably more frequently, you will have fire somewhere close to your property where you can get burning embers in and ignite the needles that drop on a yearly basis, on a seasonal basis, which means that the tree in and of itself, take a look at all the photos where the tree canopy foliage is still there and the house is totally destroyed like paradise. And you would say, oh, wait a second, that tree, doesn't need to be on the plant list because it's still there. It's not the cause. But what you end up having to do is you have to work for that tree, your trophy tree, by cleaning up all the debris that it drops on, around, and into all those nooks and crannies of your deck. Mm -hmm. Especially if that tree is coming up through your deck next to your house where it's dropping bark chips, cone scales and pine needles down in that space around where the tree's coming out under the wood planks of that deck. Yeah, yeah. Right. right. So that's my long-winded answer to, to plant lists or ignition resistant plants where we have the ability to make plants ignition resistant well in range beyond the scope of most plant lists. But 
those plant lists have been selected by botanists, of which I'm not, because of their reduced amount of dead material production. Got it. Well, Jack, we could uh, listen to you all afternoon. It's always so fascinating to hear uh, your your thoughts, your presentation, and and most importantly, we're we're really grateful for the powerful insight of uh, what burns and what doesn't burn. So we we thank you, and uh, we hope that. Um, we could get your feedback on some of the designs that we develop over the course of this year. Um, we'd love to hear what you think of them and what their, what their chances are of resisting a fire. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Jack. Uh, we really appreciate it and uh, hope to see you soon. Very welcome. Thank okay. you very much. Good yeah. luck all. Thank you so Take much. Care. Okay.